My name is Andrew Nimmo, and I'm the current president of the New South Wales chapter of the Australian Institute of Architects. I would like to welcome you all here tonight for the 2018 gold medal AS Hook address. Firstly, could I ask you all to check your mobile phones and make sure they're turned to silent, please? I'll be acting as a MC for tonight's talk, and we're hoping that there will be an opportunity at the end of the talk to have a small Q&A session over here, so if you can make some notes of the questions you'd like to ask. I'd now like to invite uh, Helen Lockhead, who's the National President-Elect of the Australian Institute of Architects and the current Dean of the Faculty of the Built Environment at UNSW, to, say, to come to the stage to say a few words. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Andrew. Hello and welcome. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight and pay my respects to elders both past, present and emerging. I'd also like to make a special welcome to our guest speaker, Emeritus Professor Alex Sarnas, not only an eminent architect, but a great colleague and friend of the faculty of the University of New South Wales Built Environment. Welcome, Alec. I'd also like to welcome all of our UNSW community, students, alumni, graduates, friends, and of course, colleagues from industry, government, and of course, the Institute of Architects. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the um, principal partners for tonight's event and for the Institute of Architects, Blue Scope Steel, and also to Matthew Wilton in particular, who I'd like to invite to the stage to say a few words before Alec gives his lecture. Thank you. Good evening. It's great to be here with you at the 2018 Australian Institute of Architects Gold Medal Tour. We at Bluescape are once again very proud to partner with the AIA. 2018 represents 33 years of Bluescape's partnership with the Institute, and over that journey, we've experienced a significant amount of change. And when we think about the environment, perhaps the biggest change has been the increase in awareness and concern about climate change. It may seem like the response has been slow, However, when we reflect upon recent history in the built environment, we've actually come a long way. We've seen the introduction of mandatory energy efficiency targets for residential and commercial buildings, and a continual focus on standards and codes to improve building performance. Industry has also responded with a range of voluntary schemes and rating tools, all designed to improve building outcomes. At Bluescope, we're constantly looking at ways to improve the products we manufacture to help the industry achieve more sustainable and resilient outcomes, and tonight, one of the products we are featuring is Carbon Coolmax Steel, which is the best thermally performing product in the Carbon Coolmax steel, uh, steel range. Coolmax is designed specifically for roofing applications to reflect the majority of heat away from buildings in order to reduce the energy required for air conditioning and cooling. If you're interested to learn more, please come see myself or any of our, my Bluescope colleagues that are here tonight, and we'd be happy to chat with you about this further. Tonight, of course, we celebrate outstanding achievement in architecture. The Gold Medal Award is the highest individual honour the Institute can bestow, and we're proud to continue our ongoing support by partnering with this year's Gold Medal Tour. On behalf of everyone at Bluescope, I'd like to offer Alec our congratulations on winning the 2018 Gold Medal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Bluescope. The Gold Medal is, the, as Matthew said, is the Australian Institute of Architects' highest honour awarded annually since 1960. The award recognises a distinguished architects who have designed or executed buildings of high merit, produced work of great distinction resulting in the advancement of architecture, or endowed the profession of architects in, in a distinguished manner. This year, Australian Institute of Architects awarded the 2018 Gold Medal to Professor Alex Zanz. From the medal citation, I'll just read, Alex Zanz, He's an outstanding practitioner and academic. His dedication to teaching, research and education has contributed significantly to the health of the profession into the future. Alex's engagement with a wide range of advisory roles continues to strengthen the value and the standing of architects within government and the community. Alex is a consummate advocate for architecture and a great champion of the architectural profession. His distinguished body of work, his ethical approach to architecture, along with his determination, passion and continuing curiosity make him a most worthy recipient of the 2018 Gold Medal. I'd also like to add that he is one of the gentlemen of architecture as well. It's my great honour to ask Alec to the stage to present the 2018 AS Hook Address. Thank you.
thank you, Andrew, and the Institute of Architects, New South Wales chapter in particular, and Blue Scope for funding um, the Institute of Architects for so many years, and particularly the gold medal tour, and to Helen and the uh, UNSW for hosting this, uh, this address here, um, a place that I am quite fond of, so thank you very much. The AS Hook address is usually the privilege and responsibility of the Australian Institute of Architects gold medalist, an honour bestowed on me earlier this year, as you know. A common theme of previous AS Hook addresses is the exploration of, of values, ideas and inspirations that shape the recipient's contribution to architecture. The title that I have chosen, Adaptive Architecture Exploring the Ethics of Design, indicates a similar intent for this AS Hook address. I will hopefully illuminate our design thinking and why we are able to apply this thinking across a relatively wide range of design disciplines, including our urban design, architecture, furniture, and industrial design. Before I begin this address, I will first acknowledge that in my case, this important honor must be recognized in the context of a practice that has grown organically over the years to the 50 or 60 people it is today. This image shows our practice as of a few months ago. I first acknowledge that the contribution of all my colleagues, past and present, over the last 35 years is central to this recognition. The leadership team of our practice has guided the way we have developed and communicated what we see as a distinctive design culture, manifest by our design values, methods of work, workplace ethics, and the relationships we forge with our clients. I wish to also acknowledge the special contribution of our associate directors and their role in advancing our practice, George Corbin, Diana Tisevska, Amy Dowse, and Bruce Chadler. In particular, the gold medal is an acknowledgement of the contribu contribution of my co-directors, here from left to right, Jonathan Evans, Milan Prignatovic, Ben Green, and Chi Mellum, with whom I have collaborated for many years. Together, we have established the firm's reputation as it stands today, and that you will see represented this evening. My final observation before I begin this presentation, and I'm not expecting you to read this, is about the awarding of the gold medal itself and what, if anything, it may indicate about the state of the profession in a national context. Of the gold medalists, and they're all on display there, at least two have been architects whose main body of work is found in other countries, although some other recipients of local origin have had prominent international careers. New South Wales origin architects dominate the award at 25, Victoria next at 14, then Queensland at 7, South Australia and the ACT at 3, Western Australia 2 and the Northern Territory at 1, at one with only Tasmania yet to be represented. Two, of, two out of the 57 gold medals awarded to date have been given to female architects, the first to Britt Anderson in 2002 and the other to Kerry Clare, who with Lindsay Clare were awarded in 2010, both from Queensland notwithstanding that females in the profession are now and have been for perhaps 20 years or more about 50% of the graduate profile and somewhere around that percentage employed in practice roles. So if you're a male and from New South Wales, my profile in short, you have a better prospect of a gold medal for now. Perhaps the future for our female architects will be brighter when we find better ways of balancing family obligations between the genders and more generally, leadership roles within professions which have a poor history when associated with questions around life-work balance change. Finding better ways to support leadership pathways for all primary carers is an important issue to address for the profession as it considers its future. In 1979, Bryce Mortlock, in this photograph um, of about 30 to 40 years in my estimation before he received the gold medal, went beyond describing his architecture to present a theory of aesthetics central to the production of all architecture, and from this theory, positioned the role of the architect in society. Mortlock argued that the decision-making process of design, in essence, centered, or centered on an aesthetic pro proposition conceived by the architect. Embedded in his proposition, as I read it, is the implication that the aesthetics of architecture is less a function of an agreement between the architect and the broader community and more about the right of any architect in relative isolation to propose architecture that they think is of value for any reason they, they determine. In short, he argued that the architect should be free to determine architectural propositions and be responsible for these propositions. 
The essence of architecture for Mortlock is the artifact itself and its integrity in relation to a set of ideas conceived by the architect. As an aside, when I first read this address, I felt that one of Mortlock's objectives may have been to offer a, a, a useful critique to the then new and relatively naive aesthetic controls that had be, become part of planning legislation. In his address, I'll in this address, I'll make a case that architecture, and by extension, all design in the built environment, is no longer about the artefact in isolation. The design integrity of each new work of architecture, as articulated by Mortlock, while still the foundation of any assessment of design, is proposed to be extended by placing new artefacts in a context defined in real time and place, and by evaluating the impact of the ensemble that results. I will argue that this aesthetic framework, broader than Mortlock's in conception, repositions the role of the architect in society. One important dimension of this aesthetic framework is the conception of architecture as integral to place. This idea requires the design process to engage with a deep understanding of each place in which design for change is undertaken. Scientific and empirical research underpins this understanding, which ultimately for the designer is formulated as a concept of a place and how it will be changed through design. In short, we as designers aim to understand the characteristics of each place in which we work, along with the opportunities one assumes within the design brief to make a better place. This frames architecture as an integrative discipline, using design thinking and skills engaged with similar objectives as other built environment disciplines, such as planning and urban design, and sub-disciplines, such as heritage and conservation. I will now present three early examples of our architecture as a benchmark to demonstrate how this conception of architecture has been implemented in practice. The first of these is the Feder Federation Pavilion from 1987 which explore the potency of historical, cultural, and physical context in design process and the role, role of the architect working in collaboration with other building, built environment specialists as custodians of a place of significance. In 1901, the Earl of Hopeton, through, the, through a British Act of Parliament, came to Centennial Park to preside over a ceremony to celebrate the momentous political decision of binding the colonial states in a federation to create a new nation called Australia. The Federation Pavilion Brief was conceived by the State Government of New South Wales under Premier Rand in 1985 to memorialise Federation. This was a temporary structure, a rotunda in typology as seen in this photograph, that also housed the foundation stone designed by the New South Wales Government architect of the day, Walter Liberty Vernon. The rotunda built from plaster as a temporary structure was demolished within a few years of construction the foundation stone within remained a not so attractive remnant of this momentous event. The competition entry was conceived as a reimagined rotunda. The design concept immediately received widespread criticism by the profession and design oriented journalists in the media. In the eyes of the critics, the proposal did not reflect the ambitions or values of a vibrant contemporary and forward thinking country. It was considered an inappropriate backward-looking conception for a monument to the creation of Australia re reflected in the architect architectural language of the proposal. The design was also interpreted as a cliché typical of postmodernist design theory, a theory widely criticised by modernist architects at the time around the world. To be fair to the critics, the intent of the proposal was not easily evident from the competition drawings. Concepts of time, past, present and future were the theme of the design proposition and not easily conveyed in a drawing like this, especially for an audience that had already made up its mind. To explain this drawing, the past is represented in the rotunda form and static nature of the external architecture, typical of pre-modern and in particular the 19th century classicism of the original rotunda design. The present is expressed in the interior, conceived as spatially dynamic in nature, with light reflected off water and white ceramic tiles within the perimeter trough and through the oculus as well as the sloping walls to cre create an ever-changing experience. Daylight engineered without electricity by Barry Webb ensured that for many days of the year the interior is brighter in ambient light than external conditions. The sloping floor and walls were enhanced by penetrating light shafts in rotation 
around the historic stone for a dynamic spatial experience to enhance the idea of representing time in built form. The idea of time was extended in the dome soffit, always the location for con contemplative ideas in architecture. In collaboration with the artist Iman Stillers, the dome became a representation of Australia, combining visual references from the past, the present, and an indication of an unknowable future. The engineering of the structure by Arab was undertaken using the most advanced engineering technology of the day, including the scientific assessment of the metal substrate and enamel for the work of art, and the use of advanced software to set out the ge geometry and facilitate manufacture of this work of art. To complete the design of the Federation Pavilion, the landscape with special vistas and views was conceived to place the monument in a utopian context and developed in collaboration with the landscape designer and architect Walter Bardem. To add interest to the architectural concept, the historian Manning Clark was asked if there were words that he could provide relevant to the purpose of the new monument to, fed to Federation. He responded by adapting the words of the poet Bernard O'Dowd from his poem Federation, commissioned for the ceremony of 1901 to add to the architecture a literary dimension. He summarized O'Dowd's poem in the phrase Mammon or Millennial Eden, as, a, as written in this letter, enlarged in a machine to enable it to be deciphered as his writing was close to illegible, as you can see. These words were then lightly carved onto the curved sandstone fascia to ensure they appeared faint in many lights, almost disappearing and reappearing throughout the day, depending on conditions. The idea was that the aspiration for this nation, conceived as a question by a dowd by a clerk, was not easily evident and perhaps made more important to contemplate when made apparent. The competition could have resulted in alternative schemes with design origins in well-considered contemporary architecture. These alternatives derive their design languages from other sources in the history of architecture, sources such as Breuer, Rossi, and Barragan, or in another option from a Japanese origin, gate typology. Any of these options may have been more attractive to the profession and the media, as they may have been perceived as original works derived from more familiar and generally acceptable architectural language, and perhaps they were right to think in this way. By comparison, the decision to develop a design language embedded in the history of the event itself was in fact personally challenging and also reflected unconventional design practice at the time. This is the first of, first of three projects I've chosen to explore the idea of place and architecture being an integrated design proposition. In the interests of time, this will also be the only project description that covers the work of the many design specialists, not to mention the builders and our clients with whom we collaborate to deliver our architecture. The second of these is the Federation Drive Project, where landscape dimensions help, under, uh, help understand context. And it was another competition for yet another political celebration, this time for the Centenary of Federation in 2001. The brief was for a ceremonial gateway to the Centennial Moor Parklands at the location of the original ceremonial access and drive into Centennial Park. The, the scheme first took inspiration from the then existing six kilometres of magnificent Moreton Bay fig trees lining Anzac Parade to form a new fig tree bounded square as context to the symbolic entry gate to the parklands required by the brief. As an aside, 16 years later, many of these trees on Anzac Parade, trees that take many decades to grow, have now been unnecessarily destroyed by the light rail route. This is an example of short-term and expedient design decision-making at the cost of medium and longer-term social and ultimately economic benefits of significance, a sub-theme of my address as it develops. Now back to this case study. About 800 metres of landscape in the axial arrangement of the ceremonial entry to Centennial Park was sympathetically redesigned with function, functionality added in the form of equestrian, bicycle, pedestrian and new ceremonial pathways in the context of rectifying major stormwater reticulation and flooding deficiencies. The form of the gate and arrangement of elements was derived from the geometrical form of a tree the plan of the ceremony and the plan of the ceremonial gate developed to represent the historic actual landscape design. 
Tree placements and geometries were analyzed in detail. The asymmetrical arrangement of existing tree trunks and branches were reflected by an exact alignment with the built form, necessitating asymmetrical variations to the construction details for the glass bead blasted stainless steel junctions between the bronze column cladding and structural iron bark. A coppice of feet, now weathered to verdigree, completes the metaphor of the tree canopy. From one side, it is a monumental gate. From the park side, it disappears until the last moment before re-entering the new arrival point to the parklands in the form of an urban square. This is the third and last of these examples. This work was the preferred scheme in a design competition that did not proceed and completes the three case studies to illustrate the proposition that design of architecture is central to the design of places. It's an addition to the National Art School in the historic jail. In this brief, the same functions were to be accommodated in two different locations within the historic jail near Taylor Square in Sydney, as shown by these diagrams. You can see on the coverage drawings to the right the two site locations. The jail from the early 1800s was designed to the Panoptican principles by Jeremy Bentham, first expounded in 1791. In the first option, the functional requirements on the site uh, were located at the center of the Panoptican geometry and established a new, and an, a new gallery was established, set out in accordance with the geometrical configuration of the jail and connected to the adaptive reuse of nearby historic buildings. The form of the new architecture is similar to adjacent historic architecture and differentiated by the use of copper and glass in the lantern. By comparison, the second site location was adjacent to perimeter boundary walls and on a parallel axis with the main entry on Forbes Street. A sculpture court is positioned beyond the entry point to extend the ground plane to the convict built and embellished walls, taking advantage of their significant historical character. The external architecture for this location was formed from the geometry of the boundary walls, arranged over four levels, consistent with the build form of adjoining conditions. The design decisions about composition, proportion, and use of terracotta materials were informed by the neoclassical and axial architecture of the corner location within the historic jail plan. The different architectural languages were the consequence of the assessment of two different places on the same campus, even though the schemes were derived from the same brief. These projects together place architecture at the centre of a bigger, often interdisciplinary design exploration, the design of place. This idea about architecture does not have its origins in a self-referential aesthetic framework morphed in particular ways to address specific urban considerations. Instead, we have explored an alternative idea, one that places greater emphasis on the interrelationship of artefacts that together aim to make better places without eroding the potency of distinctive design language or the fundamental measure of design excellence for artefacts, the delivery of design integrity across many structural, environmental, spatial, experiential, material and functional considerations. A consequence of our proposition, particularly for our urban architecture, is that our work is not image-based and accordingly not easily recognisable as a brand or trademark. Each project can only be deeply understood by first understanding its context and risks being misunderstood when evaluated from object-making aesthetic perspectives in isolation. Our design values and the way we work have origins in our residential architecture. People who commission homes usually expect to hold the property for longer time frames. They express an interest in design that is enduring and appreciates in value, measured by a complex mix of family, cultural and material factors. They often see their homes as a reflection of their identity and values in built form. We, in turn, understand the connection between appreciating material value and design excellence, or cultural value by another name, assessed through a range of technical, experiential and emotional dimensions. In this context, for example, the design process involving value management takes on its true meaning, as the cost of a design proposition or choice of a material 
or detailing under consideration is assessed in medium and longer time frames as a value proposition. We have, we have opportunity to, to undertake what we call deep design in our residential projects. I should say almost a privilege nowadays. And we have extended this way of thinking about design in various ways in all our projects. The next six residential projects are presented as vignettes to, dem to demonstrate some distinctive aspects of our residential architecture and the way it has informed our design th thinking. The first of this is a small holiday house, the Cronenberg House, 72 square metres, and is all about optimising space. Sorry. It feels spacious, although it's small. Long actual views expand interior space and are controlled to only experience landscape or ocean outlook. It was built to a tight budget. To this end, the front door becomes the northern deck away from the view to the water and capturing a view to the landscape. A veranda is also the main room experienced through the stackable glazing and the second bedroom, and, and the second bedroom is also a writer's desk and reading lounge created from furniture that transforms for each of these functions as it rolls within stainless steel channels in side walls 2.1 metres apart or the full width of the space. This will be the only, one of the few times I'll show it. It's that element there. The outside is zinc, the inside timber. At night the ceiling can be used as a light reflector, extending the landscape into the home as an uninterrupted planar surface of artificial light. The next two projects are large homes, Simon House and, and Parsley Bay Residence. The first of these is a residence that emerges out of the rock escarpment, with sandstone shaped to follow the topography for, for two levels before the form of the architecture over the next three levels becomes more evident. As an example of the interior architecture, noting for these homes, both these homes, we cannot show much, if anything, due to confidentiality requirements. We show here the lower level spa that has walls made from the same stone in single slabs progressed in detail from rough to home finishes outside to a fine, finely dressed interior finish. In this a second residence, the main functions of the house follow the natural topography, stepping down from the street to the harbour. The middle of the residence is designed around a wind-protected and private courtyard. An eight-metre high lodger connects the main spaces of the residence to the view and terrace beyond. Each bedroom on the upper levels also has a harbour view. The architectural language changes again. Doors and shutters are 4.2 metres in height and slide away completely to become invisible in the space. The design is detailed to ensure that technology is accessible for ease of maintenance. The spatial concept aims to dematerialise the difference, differences between inside and outside. Indoor and outdoor space is as one. The scale of the room is calibrated to the scale of the outlook. Another layer of fenestration, retractable solar protection blinds, or as on show in this image, retract retractable fabric for privacy and wind protection, completes an art architecture conceived to minimise form and shape and maximise living experience. I'll just point out that, that that's the inside, that's the outside, these are the tracks. Our apartment buildings for the commercial property market are an extension of the way we think about the design of homes. We believe they must be emotionally engaging, distinctive, and exceptionally well thought through to maximise interior amenity. In addition, the external architecture has an important city-making role, often acting as a catalyst for an uplift in precinct value, this time more directly associated with public benefit. One of our earliest apartment buildings in the regional city of Newcastle first changed the development controls to enable a larger building on a smaller footprint to provide a public space connecting one of the main streets in Newcastle Beach. These diagrams are an extract from our urban design study that put the argument for modifying the existing development controls. The layout also preempted SEP 65, delivering three metre floor to ceiling heights cross-ventilated apartments at close to 100% levels 
and similar levels of performance for solar access. Also evident in the plan is variation in the external architecture to respond to adjacent build form and address varying climatic conditions. In a regional city context and at the time a depressed local economy, a successful financial outcome was achieved even though the architecture was made from high quality structural precast concrete, full zinc clad upper, upper level fabric and balconies designed with operable glass louvres for better climate control. At Darling Quarter, now under construction, we chose to design in solid brick to relate the best historic buildings, to relate to the best historic buildings in or near the precinct. We felt that a new building would be better regarded by the broader community and occupants when connected to history through this material. The brickwork is contemporary in expression and detailing. For example, we chose a glazed brick designed in a memorable configuration, as indicated in this image to mark the foyer of the 42 level component of the development. On Macquarie Street, located north of the Carl Expressway, the City of Sydney required an iconic building to complete the colonnade public domain leading to the Opera House. Our concept, now under construction, was to use glass expressed in a liquid form designed to respond to special urban conditions. In addition to the public stair public stair required by the City of Sydney, the proposal enables a public access between foyers connecting Macquarie Street to East Circular Quay. Glass shaped in opaque, translucent and transparent form separates apartments, enhances views and heightens interior experiences. And what I mean by that is that you get um, these elements instead of dividing walls separating apartments, for example. We extended this idea about the glass to the design of the transfer structure and stone colonnade. The liquid glass forms, seem, the liquid glass forms seamlessly become the concrete transfer structure and then morph into the stone, the shaped stone colonnade below. On Macquarie Street, the building presents as one of a series of substantial apartment buildings, calm, elegant and refined. On East Circular Quay, the structural soffit of the public stair connecting Macquarie Street and the colonnade reflects the inherent forces of the transfer structure. This exposed concrete um, element reflects the concrete beams in Utzon's Opera House, maybe the first time this idea was manifest in Sydney in the modern era. Since then, this architectural idea has become a, a distinctive characteristic of Sydney. It's expressed in an exemplary form at Sardis Shred Square and seen again in other more recent buildings. To conclude this residential theme, our apartment buildings are conceived from site-specific considerations and have distinctive design attributes. This way of conceiving architecture works against the commercial advantages of having a distinctive house style, including the ease of documenting well understood and similar language for different projects. On the positive side, this way of conceiving architecture also works against the commodification of architecture, including the idea of the architect as a well-recognised brand and like a product to be purchased and plonked around the world, often as some sort of status symbol representing success. Instead, it places architecture at the centre of a larger ambition to do with making better precincts with broader design benefits without compromising the fundamental imperative of designing artefacts of integrity. We believe that this approach to design underpins enduring value uplift, both material and cultural, across a wide spectrum of public and private considerations. Our way of thinking about design extends beyond architectural language. We're interested in architecture that embodies high levels of functionality, including planned flexibility to reflect changing needs over time. At Cranbrook, the academic leadership of the school conceived a brief for a new campus that was based on the pedagogy of the Reggio Emilia philosophy of teaching and learning, particularly relevant for early education, kindergarten to year six. In Reggio Emilia pedagogy, the first teacher is the family and parents, the second, the school teachers themselves, and importantly for architects, the third, the school environment. 
Inspiration for successful teaching and learning environments is found in the layout and architecture of Italian villages and by the provision of non-programmed space described as a loggia, misnamed, misnamed I might add, for every three classrooms to encourage social learning in addition to other, type, other typical school requirements. Our response was to change the existing master plan to remove a street during school hours that divided the campus and in its place create a connected playground for all students of the school and design the campus with a hierarchy of open spaces, pedestrian streets and access ways connecting built form to encourage discovery, special places for play, for exercise and social learning. We also provided outdoor weather protected space to enable the entire school population uh, to, to take the entire school population on, on rainy days. And we, we placed communal learning facilities such as the gymnasium and school hall, library and administration at destinations connected by a network of, of uh, access routes, not unlike a village, usually at the corners. You can see here the uh, playground between the two parts of the development shown above in section. We scaled the architecture for K-2 differently to the three to six facilities to suit the age of the children. On the right you see the K-2 to, K to two, and on the left you see uh, three to six. We did this on purpose. When little kids look across the courtyard to see their future as big kids, the change of scale helps them better understand growth and progression. We also made visible the environmental systems of the building. In this image, water management and mechanical plant facilities. Classrooms can be extended into connecting spaces and be combined with another classroom to expand the teaching environment. Classrooms were also designed to facilitate project-based group learning as indicated here in a science teaching space. The school reported that the architecture improved concentration in the classroom they noted that in their previous school environment, children took five to 10 minutes to settle on arrival and after morning, after, after morning or afternoon breaks, including lunchtime. In this campus, by comparison, teachers reported that children are ready to learn as soon as they get into class and teaching starts. They believe it is the campus environment, including the quality of the non-programmed interior spaces and exterior play spaces that has caused this improvement in learning and teaching, noting their evidence is correlational and anecdotal. Our approach to architecture also encourages and accommodates research-led knowledge transfer to underpin practice-based design innovation. A more sustainable future for the planet is not possible without moving building technology to lower carbon, if not zero carbon, and regenerative technologies. In this project, Lend-Lease took the risk and delivered to market a commercial building designed from recycled timber and a combination of engineered timbers using CLT, LVL and Glulam technologies without a pre-sale or committed tenant, almost unheard of. These technologies in combination with the use of other environmental control systems including chill beam and PV technologies lower carbon emissions by about 50% when compared to a conventional concrete frame building. The external architecture was developed with a low iron glass curtain wall to enhance the visibility of the new timber technology inside and display the structural forces transferred through the CLT interior columns to the exposed recycled iron bark colonnade. The timber structure is also the interior finish with the surfaces fully exposed for ease of maintenance. Timber also forms the lift shafts, fire stairs and toilet amenities. This is BIM at its most sophisticated, enabling fully coordinated remote prefabrication, including services to achieve fast on-site erection. It is also designed for assembly and more importantly disassembly to facilitate recycling of the timber material at the end of the life of the building. The timber, a pine called spruce, was sourced and fabricated in Austria with Austrian manufacturing technology connected to our BIM supported design process. And yet a six, he six hectare farmed forest of Australian ra radiata pine 
using proper forest conservation techniques can grow all the timber of this building in just 2.5 hours. What does this say about Australian government policy and leadership in renewable technologies to support a lower carbon future for Australia and the planet? We extend these design values, way of thinking about design and design methodologies to other design disciplines, including industrial product and furniture design. When the City of Sydney sought to change its already well-designed furniture, we asked ourselves, why is this required? One of the reasons for change was, was that the City of Sydney sought furniture with a design language that would better reflect Sydney's evolving character. To meet this brief requirement, we found inspiration in the plate steel architecture of Sydney's historical waterfront and infrastructure and Sydney's unique post-war embrace of Scandinavian design within Australia, reflected in the Sydney School of Architecture, including the common use of Scandinavian designed homewares and the influence on design to this day of Woodson's Opera House. We aim to produce design vocabulary identifiable with Sydney's values, its lifestyle, its design culture, in, in our quest to express through urban furniture design a unique identity for Sydney. Our design vocabulary was conceived as a relaxed, casual, flowing and dynamic aesthetic expressed in its most enduring form in solid spotted gum timbers and stainless steel materials. I will use a recently completed industrial building to describe a client-led culture where design matters, as does the responsibility for delivering sustainable architecture. It is a 10,500 square metre private facility called Dangrove to support the activities of the White, White Rabbit Gallery. It was designed and built for Judith Nielsen, seen here in red, to her brief and under her inspirational direction. It was assessed taking into account design excellence legislation as determined by Graham Young and his team, shown also in this photograph. It took three and a half years to complete, from briefing to handover. It was undertaken under commercial procurement methods, including a guaranteed maximum price and a DNC contract. These are images of some of the pra practical functions, including storage of large and small works, as well as non-material art, including photography and video, and specialised workshops, including for chemical and welding operations. The whole building is designed for ease of, of forklift truck access. The brief also required security, administration, curatorial uh, facilities, library, um, a research area for PhD students, conservation and associated facilities. A, mo a more emotionally engaging aspect of the architecture is the main space used to examine as well as appreciate the, co the collection, including capacity for performance art, theatre and musical events seen in these photographs. In this commission, it was clear from the start that design included enhanced environmental performance for energy supply, waste and water management. For example, the brief required a 100-year life construction technology. To this end, the design has built-in redundancy to secure against flooding, roof water penetration, fire and the replacement of facade elements. Around 650 PVs deliver close to 100% of the electricity supply requirements notwithstanding the building's del delivery of museum standard temperature and humidity control 24-7. The DNC contract was modified to bump up design accountability and design management requirements supported by independent access for communications between the architect, contractor and the client through the project manager. I might add against legal advice. All pre-planning included value management and estimations of costs were aligned to this way of thinking. The contract was let on 80% complete detailed documentation des described as design intent. All contractor-led design was subject to a review by ourselves with independent access available to the client for advice through the project manager. This made it clear that the design was to be respected with the project management team and contractor given opportunity to set the pathway for delivery that supported this primary intent. The Builder Infinity Constructions were selected not on price alone, as they were not the lowest tender, although within budget, 
but on process, qualifications, and commitment to the de delivery of the design intent. Their attitude and skill demonstrated through, throughout the construction process, along with the modifications to a standard DNC contract, secured a successful outcome. This, is, this project is evidence that construction contracts drive construction culture. Contracts influence the quality of the built outcome, a concept well understood by industry and not so much by clients, especially when a culture of short-term transactional thinking prevails, focused on time and cost and not on longer-term design results. This is the um, part of the um, translucent main space. Global population growth and its impact on the planet is arguably the single most important force that will shape our destiny. In this context, there can be no better investment in our future security, social and economic prosperity, and the environment than to design and de deliver to the world a nation known for its beautiful, livable, and sustainable cities. Australian cities can offer this potential benefit to the nation as they are being transformed to become more urban and in the process reduce the devastating impacts of urban sprawl on our natural environment and on an increasingly scarce arable farmland. Are our generation of politicians and their staff, as well as our corporate leaders who act as the delivery agents for government, fully cognizant of this investment opportunity? Do they see the design, delivery and management of our cities as a long-term investment in our future or more as a relatively short-term transaction to be managed within a political cycle and the bottom line of delivery agents? Let's look at the evidence collated from, by Professor Bill Randolph. We know that research drives economic and social benefits through innovation and cultural change. In general, it is measured as about a one to 10 benefit. That is, $1 invested in research delivers around a $10 uplift in economic benefit to the nation. We can see from the data illustrated that less than 1% of all government funding through the Australian Research Council goes to built environment disciplines in total. Maybe hard to see down there. I might also point out that agricultural and veterinary sciences that delivers the other half of the built environment, agricultural industries and farming, as well as cruel practices, um, is, below, is below, um, below built environment. That says something about it too. This is, a, this is a striking indicator of the low value placed by academic leadership and government in the stewardship of the built environment and, and its role in the advancement of Australia. It amounts to nothing less than systemic neglect and ignorance about the built environment. It suggests that the built environment is mostly understood as a commodity to be exploited by market forces, irrespective of the impact on the environment for future generations, including the health of the biosphere for all sentient beings. And that built environment research is not that important to the prosperity of the nation and not recognised as crucial to delivering a more sustainable future for the planet. The blue graph shows two ARC grants awarded in total throughout Australia in 2013 and to this day less than 1% of total grants per annum from the ARC system. Outstanding research into the built environment such as that on heat, sinks, heat sink effects in Western Sydney and Darwin by Professor Matt Sandamuris or into low carbon living by Professor Deo Prasad has been funded through other sources including industry and local government, but not the most prestigious ARC grant money. A more positive aspect of government leadership is at the local level, manifest as the design excellent provisions in the City of Sydney LEP, including the influence of this legislation, has had in other jurisdictions such as New South Wales planning through the Office of the New South Wales Government Architect. While able to be improved in terms of administration and process, the integration of design and planning objectives reflected by design excellence registration is a conceptual breakthrough enabling both disciplines to more effectively work together for the common good. Research by Professor Rob Freestone and, and his colleagues into the impact of the design excellence provisions of the LEP, funded by one of the rarely awarded ARC grants in this field, concludes that on balance this legislation has proven public benefit. 
There is little doubt in my mind that the design excellence legislation has delivered a useful scaffold to support design endeavour. For this reason, the legislation should be strengthened by extending evaluation deeper into the design process, made more flexible in administration and less costly to designers during the selection process. To conclude my ACE hook address, I suggest that we stand at the threshold of new ways of thinking about architecture. The conditions that produce architecture are changing. These conditions reflect a different global sensibility generated by a new focus on the value of understanding local conditions in design processes, the urgent requirement to address global environmental imperatives, and the technological advances transforming the way we think and practice. Our work is only one example of many worthwhile explorations grappling to make sense of what is ahead and intent on contributing to a better world through design. A return to the work of Imant Stillers in the Federation Pavilion, conceived as a reflection of Australia's history and destiny. He drew on Aboriginal motives and mixed these motives with a convict or androgynous figure to reflect our history. He, he represented present day culture through a methodical and scientific descrip description of colour as vid visible light, composed as a half as half of a propeller with the other half in a rotational dialogue with his representation of history. He then left the largest area of the work empty, using white as a symbol of the unknowable future. This, for me, is the most interesting part of his concept. His idea for the future suggests to me that there is a lot of design opportunity in Australia. If so, what sort of design values and ideas should we encourage? Unlike many other more populous countries and older cultures, it may be easier here to shape a different future by first modifying some of our core values and behaviours where they no longer support sustainable progress. In my dream of a better future for urban architecture in Australia, the profession will first, in first ensure that it delivers a respectful and supportive work environment to encourage our best talent into built environment disciplines as this is where the most need is required, people to design and manage beautiful, livable and healthy cities in order to secure a sustainable biosphere. I would require government, corporations and major institutions to accept a leadership role as stewards of the built environment, as well as be more transparent and accountable for their decisions in design processes. For example, this means that the transfer of all risk to contractors is modified and appropriate risks are accepted to underpin by them to underpin better long-term built environment outcomes. Please ask me a question about that. I would accelerate changes underway to our design and delivery methods towards more collaborative and interdisciplinary practices. I would insist that design practice is better supported, including in DNC arrangements by providing adequate time for design, design development, design review, and detailed resolution, as well as the capacity and contract to always be able to independently communicate with our commissioning agents. My hope is that, that we as, as a community develop a deeper appreciation of the significance of the built environment on our psychosocial and material well-being. Architecture's important role has always been and remains the translation of values and ideas into built form. As we face a challenging future, architecture serves as a useful guide to the world we will leave for the generations that follow in our path. This concludes my address and I thank you for the opportunity to deliver it and for your attendance. Thank you, Alex. Um, we, uh, I am going to open it up for, for questions from the floor, but um, I'll take the opportunity to ask the first question myself. Um, Alec, one thing that's a, a theme through all your work is a strong sense of, of good manners and civility in, in the work, um, which I think comes out of acknowledging place and the importance of place. Um, there's also a very clear and extensive knowledge of history, not to repeat it, but to understand it and uh, learn from it. And that goes into your work as well. That sort of civility, when you, you talked about examples like the fig trees going in Anzac Parade or, or we had a couple of weeks ago with the um, uh, advertising of a horse race on the sides of the 
it's in the Opera House. I wonder whether that sense of civil, civility is lacking, and when you talked about stewardship and leadership at a political level, whether at that higher political level we're not getting um, what we want in terms of understanding what is civic and what is civility, and how do, how do we approach that? Well, I don't think we're getting it. I think it's really absent. It's, um, it's very um, telling that you can build um, Darling Harbour in, in the 80s and demolish it in 30 years later. It's not um, a vision that I would have for the future. But how do we change it? And I, I think it, um, it goes to this question of intergenerational thinking and the capacity to take responsibility for something outside of your KPIs. Into, into a bigger future. Now, I'm not sure if that's being naive, but um, it's, 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 very, it's very easy to look back and see how Bradfield operated and, and to see the value of that. And it's very hard to look forward and see that the way we build a typical tunnel, um, for example, any of the tunnels I've been in, motor car tunnels I've been in, are, are incredible design opportunities which could elevate your experience but in fact depress your experience. So I don't see design um, truly understood or valued as nation building. I see it as transactional and, and, a, and a, a basically a commodity to be dealt with through a process of efficiency where time and cost are the primary par parameters. And I would say value is not seen in that and certainly not long-term value. I don't know how to change that. It's, it, it's interesting though when there is such universal uh, respect and love of a building like the Sydney Opera House through its good design and anyone can talk about how whenever, whenever they go to visit that building they feel uplifted and they're being uplifted by the quality of the design. Now not every building is an opera house but it does surprise me that the um, understanding of why good design makes a difference to our environment is not a sort of a universal language that everyone appreciates and, and goes to to the people who can help them get that. Yeah, so, I mean, I think everybody who sees, oh, well, I don't know about everybody, but most, most people see uh, uplifting experiences through the building environment in some form or other. Um, maybe, the, maybe it's something to do with who pays and who benefits, because at some point in time, somebody was doing the Opera House, and we all know that it cost, theoretically cost too much. Of course, it was the best investment in Sydney. I mean, in the 1980s, all... You know, 80% of the banks located here when Keating deregulated the economy because of things like the harbour, the opera house and, and the image of the city. So the value is um, very difficult to um, give a metric to and yet it exists. And I think that's part of the um, vision issue in our leadership that, that, that perhaps some things um, are missing in their evaluation of, of, of uh, the benefits and, and one of the benefits that's most mysterious is design benefit. Now, that's why I like the work of, um, if I may say it again, Pro Professor Rob Fries and his colleagues, because they've begun to measure objectively um, excellence. Mm. And, and I, say, I say there are immeasurable things, but I say the idea that we have um, a, a more objective means of understanding the benefits of design and, and, and improving the process um, means that we're, we're looking at it. And I also think it's not a mysterious exercise that you can manage uh, design to elevate it through a process. You, I don't think you can easily legislate it, mm. but you can legislate a process that leads you towards better design outcomes. So perhaps with that, um, what I call small seed of change of perhaps momentous importance, bringing architecture and planning together in, in a common legislation, uh, perhaps that might eventually filter through to our leaders. Do you, do you think the legacy of the modern movement, in that it, there was so much emphasis on the object and of the heroic nature of architecture and um, its commodification in terms of the style, actually, as wonderful as it was, it also has led us down a path that is hard to backtrack from? I think we've backtracked from it, so the path might have been difficult, but we've backtracked from it. But I also think it was, it's been misrepresented because 
in, in, it, it was commodified and made into, it was, it, the, the, as happens with architecture, the bits that were easy to do, which lowers the cost of building, became the norm. But the modern movement, as I said, in essence was a social movement. It, was, it, was a, a, it, it had the intent to broaden um, accessibility of good design through various industrialised processes and through a different way of thinking about design, changing the culture of design. So you didn't have to have expensive cornices and all the rest of it to have a good design. You could have it with cheaper elements. So I saw it primarily um, as a social movement. And, and I also see the changes that I think will change the future of architecture as primarily a social environmental uh, movement. And, and that design, deeply done, will not just be about the style of it, but will be about the substance of it. Yeah. Now, I'd like to open the floor up to questions. I just wanted to know what you meant by place. So the way sort of I, I understood it was that it was, it was an understanding of history. Uh, and I studied at Newcastle, and, and a lot of the teaching there was about place as the environment and the ecologies. But your idea seemed, seemed quite different than that. I'm not quite understanding the question. If I'm, I apologise, I didn't quite get that. So it's about understanding uh, place in Newcastle. How you, or how you describe place? Because you talked about place quite a lot in in your speech, um, and and how do you do, how do you define that with the context of? Well, that's that's always the first question in a way. Where where does one um, one urban environment change into another, and what are the distinguishing? Uh, features of that change. What makes something a place unique is a good question to ask because obviously um, topography might change it, road systems might change, a whole lot of things allow you to move from one area to another that you can say changes its nature in, a, in an identifiable way. So, so I think if, if I go back to what I think you, you used as an example, the Newcastle area was at the edge of the CBD uh, on one of the main roads, King Street, and was connected to major public amenity in the form of a park and a beach, as well as um, community facilities and so on beyond. So it, it was what I call um, an important urban place within Newcastle. And it was different to Hunter Street and different to other parts of that, that um, coastline. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Sort of, sort of. Also, just to sort of clarify in some ways, um, in Newcastle we're taught a lot about place as you know, the broader environment and the broader ecology, but you seem to talk about place as um, the urban history and the urban context. Oh, it's everything, though. I mean, it, I think um, if we did a, um, a list of... Um, elements that we have to analyse to understand a place, it's a massive list. So I, I use as a guide three categories, open space systems, movement systems and build form. So depending where you are, the, the number of elements within those categories might change, but they help you together to understand a place. So it's a massive number of things, it's not one thing or another. Have we got another, another question out there? Your, your, the rotunda and the pavilion were both won via competitions. I'd be interested to hear your comment about, both from a, I guess from a financial perspective in your practice, your attitude to competitions these days, as well as the broader structure of how competitions are run today. Um, well, I see competitions as part of a number of ways that we can um, achieve better design outcomes, not the only way. Competitions have strengths and they have weaknesses. And the management of competitions um, can influence uh, the quality of the outcome, quite seriously change the quality of the outcome. I'm not a strong advocate for competitions as being the only way of achieving design excellence, but I see it as part of, of a range of tools, if you like, that you can use for that purpose. And in, in specific terms, um, I'm not sure exactly whether you're, whether you're going this way, but when you run an ethical practice, you pay everybody for every hour you work and you pay overtime, as we do. And that means 
running a typical city of Sydney competition costs us in the order of three to five hundred thousand dollars, and uh, the prior the, co the the remuneration might be fifty thousand dollars, and your chances are one in five, and um, there's no need for that. You can still uh, make competitions which have, for example, defined deliverable, deliverables, which are much uh, less onerous, and a pre-jury that throws out all other material that's not within the defined deliverables. And the reason why that's not a problem is because even when you win a competition, it's redesigned at least two or three times. There's no real loss of opportunity for the responsibility side of things, the approving authority to lose control of the outcome. There's plenty of opportunities to intersect with that. So I think there is, you know, there are issues with competitions in Sydney, but over, overall, it's um, it's a unique system in the world, and I think a very important contribution to architecture. And I think, on, on balance, has a public benefit with a few issues to consider for improvement. Do you, do you think with with competitions? Um, what are you really selecting? Are you selecting the design or are you selecting an architect and a process that leads to a good design? Uh, well, uh, well, I think, I, think um, I think it's a combination of those things. I mean, you could go down a route where you pre-select through a qualification-based process architects that are more suited to particular sort of projects and that might... Um, um, reduce the value of the competition or one of the ideas of the competition which is to encourage um, new people to enter the field mm -hmm. and so there's some trade-offs there. Um, I do think that essentially you're to, to even get into a competition there's got to be some sense that you can do it or a method to support the winning winner of a competition to be able to do it properly um, and so you're essentially choosing a project, you're choosing a design you know, you'd, you'd have to be um, making some poor decisions to have people in, in the final round that you don't think fundamentally either have the capacity to do it or you're prepared to risk, be, risk because you think they can grow into that skill. Mm. I've, I've thought for... I mean, I suppose the difference that uh, architects are a profession as opposed to um, a business. I mean, we do business, but it is a, um, comes under the term of a profession... Uh, which implies a certain uh, ethical standards and decision making involved. And I wonder whether or not we did, when I studied architecture, we did do a very small amount of, of philosophy. And I found that philosophy is, is really the core of ethics. You can then apply it to anything that you do. And whether you, I mean, you've been heavily involved in, in the education of architecture, do you see there's a position, a place for teaching philosophy to, to young architects? Well, curiously, I do think that. Um, I think that the world needs philosophers more than ever before. And um, it does, uh, it is one of the ways that you can develop critical thinking skills. And so um, it wasn't um, something that I had thought as strongly about 10 or 15 years ago, but it, it has been something that I, I felt has been needed more in the world. So yes, I do. I, I didn't have the benefit of, of uh, being taught any philosophy, although I have, um, as an amateur, read it a little bit. Um, I, I think it is an important. Um, it gives important insights into the way we behave, and I do think um, the professions, uh, all, well, in our political economy, all basically are there to um, earn a living. But at the heart of the legal profession is, if you like, the defence of human dignity or something like that. The heart of the medical profession is, is uh, the, um, you know, the uh, understanding of the human body and, mm. and the advancement of, of health. And I think at the heart of our profession should be something like the stewardship of the built environment. Mm. Uh, that you could also say the law is about taking anyone from A to B through a legal process, irrespective of where A is and where B is. That's... that's part of the process, but it's not the reason why I would have said um, law is important. Mm -hmm. just, just another quick question about uh, uh, education. Um, one thing I've noticed over the last 20 years is 
the um, lessening the value of the design studio and the reduction of time spent in design studios. So I went to a workshop well, six months ago where we were talking about um, architectural competencies and uh, Gerard Rymouth, his professor at UTS, said that his students have half the time in design studio than he had sort of 15 years previously and Peter Mould put his hand up and said, and you had half the time than I had. And I, I wonder how... How little time can we spend teaching people design before we haven't taught them enough? Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm going to take that, that question, broaden it to say there is a fundamental problem or failure in the way we fund research in this country. Um, in essence, esteem in universities is largely driven by research criteria, maybe about 70%. And of course, um, for every dollar, you earn in research, it usually costs $1.70 or something like that, depends on the research. Medicine could be $3. And how do you pay for that? You pay for it by robbing the teaching and learning mm. budget. And I think that's a disgraceful structural problem in our country. And I say so because research drives our future and we benefit from it. But successive governments over decades seem to be ignorant about that nexus and seem to have a, a kind of ignorance around um, this proposition. And part of that is the way we fund universities. So of course, when you're a fine school like this one and Sydney and UTS and others, um, you know, the better you get from one perspective, the harder it is to run yeah. good teaching and learning. And there are other ways we can do it as well. So that's the first point. The second point is that um, you could take a rather, um, what shall I say, a rather um, pragmatic view to say that, well, it's like that in the real world, which it is. Um, and one of the points I tried to make rather obliquely is that, um, well, not so much obliquely, but too short a form, is that um, in my life I've seen increasingly shorter times to do design work, incre increasingly less um, genuine commitment to design outcomes and by corollary um, increasing pressure to deliver things um, in an expedient way from construction and contract perspectives, money and time. And you could argue cynically that that's what we're teaching our students to do. Do it quicker. Mm. Do it less well. And I say that it's a structural problem in society here because uh, the things we do can be done better and they're around for a very long time. And that's a definition of what's strategic. If something costs a lot of money, is around for a long time, the decisions you make are strategic. And I don't think we're making strategic decisions. Hence, you can demolish stadia, you can demolish other infrastructures, and, and yeah. so on. I think we've got a question up the back here, and that might have to be our last one. Alec, you're talking about um, looking to government for um, research. Maybe... Would, would an option be looking to industry for research if government doesn't recognise the value in it? Yeah, I think that's what universities are doing. And I know this university's um, changed its promotion criteria to um, harmonise, not the right word, but to give more equality to different forms of funding. The issue has always been and remains that if you're funded by industry, you may have research that biases that industry, try tobacco research. And so the, the, the issue there is an ethical issue. Um, but at the same time, um, all our universities are, if you like, compelled now to look much wider uh, to fund the research. And I'm not against it, but it does have some real issues. Does, does it need to be much better? Uh joining between practice and, and, and the academies? Well, I think that, that's what I think. Obviously, I'm quite biased. I'm sure you that's are That's why I asked you that. <laughs> well, I think so, because I think, um, especially as we face change, we face... I, I don't think it's um, just, you know, the time we live in. I think we are seeing uh, deep indicators of, of um, cultural change, you know. I mean... You know, Michelle Simon here is going to invent the quantum computer, we hope, one day, and that's going to be transformed. All sorts of things are transforming. Um, these are the times, I think, when uh, leading thinking 
and leading practice have greatest mutual benefit. And, and I, I do think it waxes and wanes, but this is the time for it to wax. Thank you very much, Helen. Could you all thank please thank Alexander? <laughs>